the chairman said, is not a film star, is not a celebrity in the sense of page three, but is a man who is looked upon with veneration and worship. Notwithstanding the fact, in a recent interview, he said, we are not superhumans, we are not saints, but we are firmly grounded in our values. And that is what we try to impart to students that when we talk of maximization of profit, and particularly after the Harshad Mentor Scam 1991, the first thing I do, I teach finance and accounting. I say maximize profits, yes, but maximization of most tax legitimate profits or most tax legitimate cash flow. Don't go for short run gains. Look at medium, long term gains. Look at the means and the ends. Don't try to say the end matters, the means don't. We are trying to inculcate these values into these young boys and girls who are here and I have been trying to do that wherever I have taught. Jamnal al Bajak, where I taught for 30 years. I am Amdavad, who is a visiting faculty and is from the Institute also. Because students get carried away by this profit maximization concept, cash flow concept, trying to go to the market, buying and selling shares, making a lot of money, taking a loan even before they have completed their studies. And uh, that's where word of caution is required from these youngsters and that's what we are trying to do here and are we trying to do in the classroom. And particularly after 1991, Harshad Mehta's where many college students were also involved and going their fingers badly in the market and very careful to say that maximization of profit is subject to these ground rules. And these ground rules are well said in many of the quotes which you see here of Mr. Narayanamurti. And the one that uh, I use in the classroom, it's better to lose one billion dollars than a night's sleep. Very difficult statement. But here is a man who walks the talk. I have taught groups in different parts of the world and I often say, can you tell me why cash surplus is a more serious problem than cash deficit? Then I tell them, these are the problems if you have a cash surplus. Invariably the answer is whether Indian or foreign. No, we rather prefer a cash surplus than a cash deficit. Then let us see what happens when there's surplus and there are problems. We'll see when the problems come. No, this is the message. It's better to lose one billion dollar than a night's sleep. And here is the man who says it. Here is the man who has an empire called Infosys. Not a celebrity, not a film star. First line or first generation entrepreneur who has come up the hard way and is a role model to all of us. So the youngsters who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to go into the field to make money, there is nothing wrong about it. But please don't forget the rules of the game. As Dr. Radha Krishnan would say many times, dharma is the only way of life. And in this context, dharma means rectitude and righteousness. Your decisions must be unimpeachable. Your transactions must be impeccable. So that is the message that we get from Sri Narayan Murthy. And all the students were so excited to see him down. I would not stand between the students and Mr. Narayan Murthy, but without telling you one or two things, in the short period that we have had on the theme of this seminar challenges for Indian multinationals, our chairman wanted all of us to work very hard from the month of January itself. And he had organized a workshop on the theme of this seminar so that we are all mentally well prepared for this occasion. And arising out of that workshop, where our students and research scholars were put to some work. We had brought out a publication in the very first year of our operation. This is our first publication, Challenges for Indian Multinationals. <laughs> Full credit must go to VP Mandal and the chairman for the simple reason that most institutes stop a publication, but when it comes to funding the publication or bringing out the publication, they usually back out, saying who will buy this and what will be the return on investment. He will not ask me any such question. And therefore, one more, please give him a very big hand. <laughs> Following that, since this institute is named after Dr. V. N. Bedeker, the father of Dr. V. D. Bedeker, we thought that his vision of establishing a management institute was uh, not really fulfilled when he was alive. However, the family has carried it through and the institute is there, building number four, which is tall and will become taller sooner not merely in physical stature, but also in terms of the contribution to intellectual capital. Arising out of the uh, situation that we were in, when Dr. V. N. Bedeker's vision was realized, but after his death, we thought of bringing out a publication in honor of the Dr. V. N. Bedeker, which is known as the Dr. V. N. Bedeker Research Volume, which will be released at the kind hands of Sri N. R. Narayamurti today. The Bedeker Research Volume, which is still unpacked, 
is the outcome of the efforts that the entire team, the knowledge management team, led by me, Mr. Rajgopal Iyer of our IT section, Mr. Sandeep Bowser, the librarian, Mr. Deepak Gokhale from the office, and Mr. Ajita Atari looking after the archives and my secretary over there, have put in a lot of effort day and night to bring out this wonderful volume which you will see in a few minutes from now. Please give them a very big hand. This volume is a collection of thoughts from people who are working here and what they think of the building now and what they thought of Dr. V. N. Bedekar. It also includes articles from my research scholars, from my PhD students who have passed out, from my PhD students who are still working with me and from the PhD students who are about to register. It includes the network of visiting faculty and it also includes the network of full-time faculty. All of them have contributed their might to this and I must, last but not the least, thank Mr. Vilas for the wonderful work that he has done. When you see the work, you will see it for yourself now very soon. So please give Mr. Vilas a special big hand. This is what I wanted to say and since I am also very eager to listen to Mr. Narayan Murthy, I will see what is the next item that I have on the agenda before I forget it. This much from my side, I can go on giving lectures on all his speeches which he has given and all the Infosys annual reports that I have read for my classroom. But I normally carry the Infosys annual report instead of textbooks. It's almost like a PhD thesis every year. <laughs> I would now request Professor V.S. Bhattari, the one and only one who managed to bring Mr. Narayan Murthy here. Please give Mr. Bhattari. <laughs> Mr. Bhattari, that let me more for you than for me. <laughs> We are not introducing Mr. Narayan Murthy, he needs no introduction. But Mr. Bhattai would like to say a few words and he has timed it according to him and you know he is very strict about time. So hand over to Professor Bhattai. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the name is on the dance. It's my privilege and honor. Although, thanks to Dr. Guru Prasad Murthy because uh, 90% of it is covered, so there is nothing more I have to say. So I can stick to the timings of two and a half minutes or two minutes, which Dr. Bedekar has insisted on that. I will say that he is a mentor of Generation X and then the mentor of Infosys. Sir, you have made us proud of being an Indian. And he is the one with a $250 investment today it has gone more than $2 billion and that all this is through the innovation. Just yesterday, there is an article, sir, on that, the future about innovation. And one thing, how did this company become so rich is, he knew if one wants to become rich, make others rich. Today, thousands of millionaires have there because of associating with Infosys, either internally or externally. A NASCOM past president, director of DBS Bank, Singapore, IT advisor to many Asian countries, and put India on the global map, just one I would like to say which has not been said, is the 300 United States American graduates are coming to Mysore for a training, and this is the one, what more you want, say that put India on the global map. abroad, not in India, today American graduates are coming to Mysore for training. That's what more you need. And this is a, could we think of a better personality than Mr. Narayan Murthy of challenges to Indian multinationals? And first visit to Thane, I will take another 30 seconds more, sir. Passion and commitment for the generation X has made you to come, not for our institute, not for Dr. Gurukhar Murthy, not for me. It is the one Next generation, you have a future, and that made him to come down here. <laughs> he loves to, when I asked his uh, secretary, Mr. Panjo, you know, we will have a call of honor. I said, forget about it. 
he would like to spend more time with the interaction, not with the God of honor. He would rather very rather prefer to interact. That's the one. And the second reason is, sir, our 18 months efforts have needed results. We can't say how much indebted to you we are for you. Right. And as Dr. Guru Prasad Murthy has said, you know, even at the age of 80, people want to become chief ministers now. You know, whereas at the age of 58, Mr. Narayan Murthy handed over the CEO position to Mr. Nandan and said, let me become a mentor. I think we need to learn that rather sticking to the chair, Kisa Kursika, is no more applicable here and an exception only makes the rule. And here is an exception, sir. And driven by values already said, in the 21st century of materialistic world, it is the values that count. We wish the younger generation, please, we have a few years to go, but you people have a long way to go. Sir, India needs more such personnel. And we only pray that let Infosys be the first Indian company most respected sooner than later company in the world for its values. Now, may I request you, let us welcome Mr. Narayan Murthy giving a big hand. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Bakri, and thank you to students. 10.45 is the scheduled time. We have a few more minutes for his keynote address. Just five minutes, I will take a maximum. Mr. Narayan Murthy, sir, out of our gratitude, token of respect, love and affection, we would like to present a very small memento to you. I would like to present a small flower to Mr. Ashan Desai of Master, who is here.
sense of values was very clearly demonstrated in the last week or so when those of us, the elder ones, were equivocal, were dilly-dallying, were not certain, were scared of expressing our views on a very important issue. The youngsters all over the country have stood up for what they believe is right. So I think this is a great example of what the youth can do. Now, the topic that has been chosen today is challenges for Indian multinationals. India has been growing at 6% plus in the last 15 years since the economic reforms undertaken by Dr. Manmohan Singh when he was the finance minister. This year, they have grown by 8 plus percentage. The exports are about 75 to 80 billion dollars. That has been growing at 20 percent. The imports are somewhere around 100 plus billion dollars which is very positive because it means that we are actually investing in building up our infrastructure so that we can achieve even greater growth. 78% of the GDP has been contributed by the private sector, which again is a very, very important data point because at the end of the day, I believe it's the private sector that will take this country forward. And of course, the stock market index has reached an all-time high. Of course, now it's slightly lower, but that's understandable. It's still at a very impressive level now. Plus, there are 100 Indian companies with market capitalization exceeding a billion dollars, which again is a very clear indication of the fact that our economy is growing, our companies have more and more of a global mindset, and they want to bring in innovation so that their companies become more and more valuable. We have at the same time work to produce a $200 PC, which is approximately about 10,000 rupees, and a lakh, a car which costs 1 lakh of rupees, which Ratan, Ratan Tata is trying to produce, and that's approximately about $2,500. What that means is we have we are learning the art of producing quality products at affordable prices. This is extremely important if you want to succeed in the global marketplace. And the challenge there is how do you make sure that you produce world-class quality products on time within budgeted costs at affordable prices. I think that is the challenge that all of us have if we want to succeed. On the, on the sector, on the, on the, on the, on the economic uh, da uh, data, I would say that we have today somewhere around 100 million telephone lines, you know, as against something like uh, 10 million or so about 15, 20 years ago, and that's, you know, this growth has primarily come in the last five years. However, we are still 1% of the global trade, in fact, less than 1%. Our exports are only a small amount of $80 per person, as against China's $800. China, each person in China today exports $800, whereas we export only $80. Our exports form just about 11% of our GDP. On the other hand, if you look at countries like China, Brazil, Mexico, etc., they are somewhere around 30%. Now, why are exports important? The reason is very simple. If you solve the, if you want to solve the problem of poverty, you have to create jobs. And if you want to create jobs, 
then you need to be able to sell your products and services. If you want to sell your products and services, you need disposable income in the hands of people. Unfortunately, in India today, at this point of time, valuing perhaps about 15% of the people, which is about 150 million people, the rest of them do not have enough disposable income to buy your products and services. So the solution to creating jobs is necessarily focusing on exports. That's exactly what China has done. That is what East European Tigers did. That's what Japan did. That's what Mexico is doing. Or uh, without exception, most countries, or, or without exception, countries that went from a low level of development to a higher level of development have all focused on exports. And that's why creating Indian multinationals becomes extremely important. That's the reason why all of us have to focus on creating more and more and more Indian multinationals. Now, China has been creating something like 13 million jobs a year for the last 12 years. China has created a whopping 156 million jobs in the last 12 years, while India has done something like 10 million jobs. So, if we have to solve the problem of poverty, if we have to bring better disposable income to our people, if we have to create opportunities for our youngsters in rural areas, opportunities for the disadvantaged uh, men and women, the only solution is to create more jobs and the solution comes out of, as I said, focusing on exports and creating multinationals. So I must congratulate the school on focusing on the challenges of creating Indian MNCs. Now, what is it that we need to do to create more and more and more Indian MNCs? First, we have to become more confident. We have to overcome our colonial handle because whether you like it or not, the majority of opportunities are in our markets are in G7 countries and perhaps in China because China is growing at a, walk, at a very fast growth rate. You all know how our Indian steel companies, Indian cement companies have, have gained tremendous market capitalization because of the opportunities provided by China. Let us all be very, very clear. The reason why our cement and steel companies are doing well in the stock market is simply because there is considerable demand for steel and cement in China and that is creating, uh, creating a shortage in the global market and, and the Indian companies are able to export more the Indian, and, and we are not able to import any shortfalls into the country, thereby the prices are going up and that's how the Indian companies are doing well. Okay. So we have to become more and more confident to face people from other cultures, to face uh, people who are our rulers, to face the G7 countries, to negotiate with them, to, 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 to sell to them, to create a story in front of them. That is the thing. Second is, we have to become more confident to take tough decisions. If you want to go into the global market, marketplace. If you want to be an MNC, then you have to take very tough decisions. And tough decisions can be taken only if you become more and more and more confident. Now what is the, what do we need to do to become more confident? First, we have to become more and more open. Openness is a sign of self-confidence. Openness to accept good ideas from other people. Openness to subordinate your ego to people uh, and accept good ideas from others, openness to look at, uh, you know, look at the leadership of ideas rather than leadership of men and women or leadership of hierarchy, openness to accept good ideas from people who are younger than us, openness to look at, uh, take, to take decisions based on data, these are all extremely important. Next, we have to become proactive. By and large, Indians are very reactive because of a certain historical background, 
we have tended to become more and more more and more reactive. We don't do things on a proactive basis. We do Let us be very, very clear. If you want to be compete in the global marketplace, if you want to be a MNC, if you want to succeed in exporting more and more, if you want to compete with the best in G7 countries, you have to accept metropolis. There is no shortcut to that. We also have to become a learning organization, which means we have to keep our eyes and ears open. We have to get the best ideas from anywhere in the world in each of the dimensions of our operations, use those ideas perhaps, adapt them, improve upon them. Because unless you are a learning organization, you will not be able to succeed. You have to embrace speed. Because at the end of the day, the one of the most distinctive advantages of a successful corporation is speed. You must ask the question, are we doing things faster today compared to yesterday, last month, last quarter, last year, etc. Very, very important. Next, innovation or imagination. You must ask the question, are we bringing better ideas to the marketplace today compared to yesterday, last month, last quarter. Once you start asking, once you start giving opportunity to youngsters to come out with better ideas, then that corporation will succeed very well. For example, we conduct several times a year an exercise called ideation exercise. There, the rule of the game that day is anybody above 30 is not allowed to speak. He or she can write down ideas, you know, they can, they can, they can then implement them, they can, of course, later on they can question all of that. But that day belongs to people below 30. And that's the day when people come and say, this is something I don't like in the organization, this is the way we can improve. It's all constructive, it's not, it, it, it's not about finding, uh, uh, finding faults in the organization, it's all about bringing out better and better ideas. Next, of course, excellence in executors. Your ideas are absolutely useless unless you can implement them very well, unless you can bring about a better level of excellence in executing those ideas. Because at the end of the day, what distinguishes a, a successful corporation from a not so successful corporation is how well you execute those ideas. Brand building is extremely important. If you want to succeed as a multinational corporation, then you must build brand. What is brand? Brand at the end of the day is nothing but a trust mark, right? It is, you know, it, it, it's people saying, we trust you. And if you want successful relationships, you want to enhance your revenue, if you want continued relationships, then you have to build a trust with the consumer. And if you want to build trust with the consumer, then you have to build brand. In fact, for example, when somebody talks about L'Oreal, right, everybody, you know, it's a French company, and everybody knows the world. Similarly, you know, if you talk about Sony, the brand of Sony is extraordinarily high. You, you know, you talk about Unilever, you, you know, I, you talk about computers like Hewlett Packard. These are all one, Microsoft, these are all one true brands that have been built. So, if an Indian MNC wants to succeed, then MNCs have to create brand. In, if you want to create brand, then you have to move from cost to value. In other words, we cannot afford to play as simply cost-focused players. We cannot say we'll reduce your cost. We'll have to say we'll bring you better value. All, all corporations which have built a brand in the world have focused on value to the customer, right? As all of you have studied economics, you understand the price is what you pay, value is what you get. So it's extremely important you move from cost paradigm to value paradigm. Then of course we have to create better corporate governance. I define corporate governance as doing all that is necessary to maximize shareholder value on a sustainable basis while ensuring fairness to all the stakeholders. Customers, employees, investors, vendor partners, government of the land and the society. It's extremely, we have to raise the transparency, you have to bring a better level of accountability. And then of course, the other important thing, perhaps the most important thing is, 
we have to learn to work in multicultural teams. You have to learn to, to work with Englishmen. You have to learn to work with American women. You have to learn to work with Spanish people. You have to learn to work with Chinese people because that's a multinational has operations in multiple countries. And you have to learn to leverage the power of all these multicultural talent. And of course, we need risk modeling. Unfortunately, most Indian companies are poor in creating analytical models for risk assessment. You cannot depend too much on one customer. You cannot depend too much on one technology, too much on one GFA, etc. So risk modeling is extremely important. Next, of course, we, the managers in a, multi in a multinational corporation, have to become much more technology savvy. Unfortunately, in, in, in India, in several parts of the world, the technology awareness of our managers is still not up to the mark. We have to enhance that. I mean, I can go on and on and on because I think all of you have, have set a good standard by, by you know, completing a task ahead of time. I think I too want to do that. I have a record of completing five minutes ahead of my schedule generally, and I want to close my talk because we still have five minutes, and I would rather answer your question and answers because that's where I think I will have tremendous learning. And I have only one, one rule though. Alternate questions will have to be from women and men. Okay? First question by a girl and then by a boy, etc. Et okay? Good, please. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have failed in doing this. Let us remember, 
that India is still at 65% literacy, number one. Number two, 50% of the schools in, in, in rural India have one teacher for every two classes, every two sections, which means that we have not been able to address the basic issue of primary and secondary education. Only when we provide world-class primary and secondary education to all the children, then only this country will become a better place because everybody will become competition worthy and the country will move, everybody will improve. So instead of solving that, which is a very, very difficult problem, you can go and say, okay, tomorrow I will have this much of reservation. But that's taking, that's a cop out strategy. That is not the, that's not a difficult thing to do. You can pop anything you want in the parliament. But the difficult thing is to ensure that every village, there are something like what, 650,000 villages or so in this country, right? In every village, you provide the best possible education. I would fully support it. I am 100% for it. I accept that there has been absolute injustice to the children of disadvantaged sectors. No, I think, uh, why don't you, I, that's better. I don't want to, that, that's not interactive. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Please stand up and stand up and raise the mic. Please pass on the mic. Good morning, sir. I am Gaurav Chopra from MMS One. Uh, so my question is very simple one. Uh, what, according to you, is the biggest challenge for an uh, Indian multinational? That's about it. Well, questions are always simple, answers are very difficult. <laughs> Remember, as I said, the biggest challenge is creating brand equity. Tomorrow, if you can create a product which, when used by people all over the world, they say it is from this company in India, I think that is the biggest challenge. If you can create brand equity, then you, so you get sustained revenue, you get good profits, you attract the best quality customers, you attract the best quality employees from all over the world, you attract the best quality investors from all over the world. So the biggest challenge is creating brand. That's the biggest challenge. Yes. Please. Please. Please.
am I enhancing the trust, the confidence, the enthusiasm, and energy of the rest of the people, the rest of the community members? That's all there is. Nothing else. I'm a construction builder. Please. Because 
our engineers, our doctors, the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs of India, they all succeeded. Today, the respect of India is a lot more than what our, our diplomats, our politicians, our corporate leaders, you know, our bureaucrats paid for the last 15 years. In the last 15 years, these people, people of Indian origin, who have worked hard, who have demonstrated they are good citizens to those societies, they have contributed tremendously to creating practical independence. So don't stop it. Work hard to make sure that this place is more attractive.
doing that requires that you arrange the quality to spend the best part of their life, best part of their day in your company. And to do that, you have to create enough excitement for them, enough incentives for them to come back to the office every morning, right, at 8 o'clock, and spend the best part of the day adding value to you. So that's the biggest step. In fact, that's why our CFO, one of the finest, I mean, probably the best CFO in the country, he won the first best CFO award in India. He shifted human resources So the challenge is, the issue is not for 
outsiders to say Bihar will impose good leadership on Bihar. I think the people of Bihar have to realize that if they want to make progress, they need good leaders, they must elect them. Because we have accepted democracy. That's the only instrument we have. So, they, it's, it's not for us. If Bihar becomes much more uh, oriented towards industry, if Bihar creates infrastructure, Bihar has English medium schools for the children to go from Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, so that the children, you know, can study there. If Bihar creates decent airports so that people can go and come back quickly, if Bihar creates good roads, if Bihar, all of that, then I'm sure people will go there, why not? Let's remember, you know, France is the same size of Bihar. Now, while Bihar probably has something like, uh, let's say, uh, $70 billion of, uh, <coughs> that translates to about what, 280,000 crores of GDP, France has, it's, it's something like this, 200 times that. You know, uh, no more than that, 250 times, 1.75 trillion. So the point I'm making is that the leaders, the, the youth in Bihar, the, they have to stand up and say, enough is enough, we want this society to progress, we want this leaders. So you can't impose it from outside, it has to come from within. So this is Rajkumar Singh, I have recently completed my MBA. Now India is speaking by global standards. So how much time do you think that for India, it will come up to the standards of China, Japan and then you? You know what, China has already become more than twice as India in its total GDP. China is somewhere around 1.6 or 1.7 trillion dollars. And India is at about 800 billion. China's economy is going at 9-10%. This year, we grew at 8%. Chinese, China has exports for uh, 840 or 850 billion dollars. India is still at 70 or 75 billion dollars. Uh, so, I think China is progressing much faster than India. But we can do better, definitely we can do better. We can compete with them if we reduce bureaucracy. Whenever I talk to people outside India, they say, oh, your country is very difficult to do business because you are very bad to do business. You know, I, mean, I think unless we reduce the bureaucracy, unless we take the cost position, unless we improve the infrastructure, you know, while coming from Santa Cruz, one hour journey, both sides, whenever I looked, I looked there, I saw there, I saw very bad houses. Why can't, you know, I gave, I gave uh, the Naksar Memorial Lecture a couple of months ago, and I spoke on urban idea on how to handle, you know, the urban planning in India. For example, if you take pragmatic, sensitive decisions on urban planning in Bombay, you can create wonderful living place for all the people who are living in slums. It's a pure economic decision making. Unfortunately, we, we, don't, we don't look at long term interests. We do everything on a short term basis. That's why this country is progressive. No. But if we can, if we can think about changing that, I'm for the reason. We can, we can move fast. But I don't know whether we can be kind or not. That's, that's, you know, we have to, to look at it very carefully. You have to look at data, you have to look at the issues, and then... Well, thanks for, I have two more questions, then Dr. Major, and a few words, and then we'll stop. Absolutely. Uh, when we talk about multinational company, one thing that comes to our mind is 
long working hours. With this long working hours, how can we make justice to our personal life? Uh, in simple words, do we have a perfect balance between a professional life and personal life? Can we have a perfect balance between these two? You know, my view is every generation in India will have to work very hard work smart, make a lot of sacrifices so that our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can have a better world in life. So we should not worry about our work-life balance. We should worry about how we can create a better India. And, uh, you know, Germany, for example, after World War II, they made it mandatory for people to work something like 12 hour days. They all worked. So I don't think as a youngster, you should worry about how far you work. My friend, this is going to be the last question. The best possible message you have given, we have to work hard, not that hard you have to work. I'm Eric, a practicing capital accountant. I have a specific question for you. Just, uh, we look forward to you, we, we look up to you as a mentor of all of India, even the younger generation is looking at you. My question is, if uh, and what could be done to institutionalize this kind of entrepreneurship drive and dynam dynamism? Because Indian MNCs have come up. If you look at the MNCs which have come up, they have come up because of leadership, of dynamism of a few individuals. If you look at the rest of us, I mean, quite a few of us would rather do jobs than do become entrepreneurs. And business schools, like the one which we are standing here, where I teach also, are not able to transmit that dynamism into the students. I mean, students aspire to do jobs rather than go into crucibles of innovation, as you rightly mentioned. So, how does that diffidence of the earlier generation get removed? And we have a number of leaders who will really pitchfork India into the next century. So, how could it be institutionalized? How, how could it be professionalized? Well, I got companies as well as in respect of the general public. No, I, I think first one is role models are very important. So if you want to inspire instance, if you want to create enthusiasm in them, then you need role models. You have to provide greater visibility to those role models. Role models, not so much in terms of the people in the sensei, top 20 stocks of sensei. No, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, you should, grow, you should showcase an entrepreneur in a village. You showcase a small entrepreneur in, in Thane. Because people have to realize that I don't have to be number three in the stock market capitalization to become a role model. They must be able to identify easily with those role models. Similarly, you have to showcase a wonderful role model in creating excellent institutions like this. You have to create role models in among people who have fought for some principles. You know, that you have not made a partner. Uh, people like that. I think by, by making sure that films from them uh, are produced and then are shown to youngsters all over the country, by creating interactions with, with role models for youngsters, by writing books about them, you know, I think that, that's it. The second is leaders in every community, leaders Every organization, they have to walk the talk. Just as Mahatma Gandhi walked the talk, I would say it's probably the only Indian politician, the only Indian who has walked the talk, right? And he brought so much of confidence to so many Indians. So I think all of us have to conduct ourselves in a manner that will raise the confidence of the Indians. So I, I would say that. Visibility, showcasing, and walking the talk. Well, now let us listen to Professor Devra. He has uh, is an extraordinary person. We have all uh, uh, looked after him. We have so much from him. He has held 
very, very important conversations. And I mean, so I, I send you the conversation. Thank you. First of all, I must admit that uh, we have a large number of billionaires in India. Number is growing. But out, out of all those billionaires, one who wears his brilliance the best is next to <laughs> There is nothing wrong in being a brilliant, nothing wrong in being wealthy. But it depends on how you wear your wealth, how you use your wealth, what you think of wealth, and who controls whom, whether money controls you, or you control money. The main problem in India, as I see, is most of the time people are controlled by money and they control the money. So here is another example where someone who knows how to control money rather than allowing money to control them. I think that makes him the role model and that makes him somebody who I wish a large number of Indians, wealthy Indians, I feel that there are reasons why we are creating billionaires and there are reasons why we cannot create billionaires. The wealth comes out of value of your work. In my opinion, those who are in software industry, I would say software services business, Rather than call it, calling it a software industry, I would rather call it a software uh, services business. If value of your hour work done is valued by a customer at much higher level than what your local norms are, then obviously you make more money, you make more wealth. The reason why software industry in India is successful is because we are serving the rest of the world which value our hours worth far differently than an average Indian employer will value. And therefore, software industry has succeeded. In case of hardware, exactly opposite exists. In case of hardware today, as you know, you do your MBBS graduation, you do your B in mechanical engineering or you do your B in civil engineering and you end up with a job of maybe, if you are lucky, 8, 9,000 rupees. That's where you start. Whereas you join so-called IT enabled service, which is really a, a different kind of service. And I don't know why it is club in IT. But if you look at call center, a good looking girl possibly will get 50,000 rupees as she starts working there. Because that is the kind of value the customer is willing to pay for her service. Now, does it mean, therefore, I think we are getting, because of this situation, the whole country is getting a bit skewed. And that's where the strength of software has really hurt our strength in hardware. In hardware business, today, for engineering industry, it is difficult to find manpower. You look at almost every other professional area, you will find that it is difficult that the talents of the kind which are required to really build these companies strong are not existing. Now look at how government policies affect the whole exercise. It is extremely difficult as anybody who knows manufacturing hardware would know that running an industry in India is a nightmare primarily because of the government. Consequently, you see characters of dead industries in this town, in every town, every part of India. So until and unless this disparity is well understood, we are not going to solve the problem that we are facing today 
China has created more than 9 crore jobs, blue collar jobs. In this same period of last 14 years, India in real sense has declined our blue collar jobs. There is a decline in blue collar jobs. Another efficiency I want to point out, I mean, we talked, I just finished a conference, India, China, Economic and Cultural Council conference, and there I pointed out that while we have 18 billion dollars of bilateral trade, and till last year India was exporting more to China than importing from China, and everybody was delighted. And then only we realized that what we were exporting was iron ore. 6.5 billion dollars worth of iron ore India exported to China. Had we converted an iron ore into steel and exported it to China, we would have added in this country's wealth another 15 to 20 billion dollars. Why we did not do it? Because of our industrial policies, because of our non-sensitivity of what our priorities are, and understanding the real significance of our success in software or any other area. We often talk of, we just asked, talked about a question about migration of Indians. And I think we are, I am glad that so many Indians went abroad. Had they not gone there, we would not have a today's software industry in this country. We would not have got software business in this country. They are the ones, they were the ambassadors of India to make India, to sell India properly. If India, India is respected, if everybody in the world and, and words swings, opinions swing by uh, more of an imagination. And therefore, everybody feels that every Indian is a great software man. You all I know, that's not true. But still, that reputation helps us in every respect. I remember a long time ago when we were sitting in Rajiv Gandhi and uh, our uh, ambassador uh, in the US, uh, Abhi Hussain. We talked about brain drain. That was the much discussed topic in the 90s, early 80s. Brain drain and how to stop IIT, all the graduates were going abroad. And uh, I said, no, we, let's not call it brain drain, let's call it brain trust. And uh, everybody was comfortable. But then Abhi Hussain made a very interesting point. He said, uh, Rajiv Ji, brain drain is better than brain in drain. <laughs> So until and unless we create avenues for bright 